around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. We'd like to take the opportunity today to welcome you to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. It's always a joy to be with you and to share with you from the Word of God. We're hearing a lot of uh, results, uh, encouraging results from this latest series, Matthew chapter 24, the time of the end. People are sharing how much they are learning from the Holy Scriptures, and there's a whole lot more to learn as we continue to go through this 24th chapter. And we've decided, as we said, to edit this and put it into a DVD series so that in your private time or maybe Bible study time or you want to have a group study, bringing people in to sit down, to watch the DVDs, and to listen and to grow profusely from the Holy Scriptures. There's such a famine of the Word of God today. Not on God's part. The famine is on the ministry part. Because they don't have a hunger for the word. They don't want to preach anything controversial. God forbid they say something about sin and damnation and somebody dying lost and going to a devil's hell. God forbid that you say anything like that. Just preach fluff and stuff. Make us feel good. Don't tell us there's a judgment day. Don't tell us there is a reckoning day. Don't tell us there's a day of accountability. Don't do that. That messes up the party. Life is a probation. I said life is a probation, and you're getting ready in this life for eternal life. And depending on how you live, depending on how you live, will determine your eternal destiny. Yesterday, we concluded here in Matthew 24, verse 40. We're going to pick back up in verse 41, but I want to tie again together to help you to understand these verses are not talking about a pre-tribulation rapture, which many through the years have attempted to do so, but they don't look with clarity what Jesus is saying during this great, great speech, this great expose, this great understanding of how the time of the end will be and how it will be when Christ returns. Matthew 24, as I said, we're going to pick up in verse 41, but I want to tie Verses 38, 39, and 40 with it. For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There shall be two in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now, let's look at this again. Two women will be at the mill grinding. Grinding was and still is in the East a woman's job. Again, it is the wicked that is removed under the auspices of the judgment of God. Remember how I shared yesterday, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, 
They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Who was taken away by the flood? Those that knew not. Two shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, the other left. Who is God taking? He's taking those who know not. It is your responsibility to know, to understand, to discern the signs of the time. Matthew chapter 16, verse 3. Oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the time. Romans 13, 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of God. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Again, we're talking about those that know will be looking. Those that do not know will be taken away. 1 Thessalonians 5.1. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly. For yourselves know. You're supposed to know. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Who's the sudden destruction coming upon? Those who do not know. Those who do not know, then sudden destruction comes upon them that do not know. Let's, let's look at that closely. Let's look at that very closely. I want to I look at that again myself today just for the purpose of looking at it for my sake. They'll say peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. So we see that Paul says, but of the times and of the seasons, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. You go back to Matthew 24. Had the thief known in what hour the thief, or had the master of the house known what hour the thief would have broken into his house, he would not have suffered his house to have been broken up. Those that are taken away are not the righteous. They're not the redeemed. They're not the saved. They're the lost. Why? They know not. They knew not. Get this now. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. Who's taken away? The wicked. I shared with you yesterday, Proverbs 10, 30. The righteous shall never be removed in the, from the earth. The wicked shall not inhabit, or the wicked shall not inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall what? They shall inherit the earth. The wicked are the ones that are taken away. Why? They're taken away because they don't know. They don't know. Watch this. Luke 21, 25 through 28. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars 
and upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things shall begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now, instead of looking horizontally, instead of looking at everything that's around you, when men's hearts are failing them for fear, they're going to be looking horizontally. They're going to be looking at everything that's wrong. Earthquakes, famines, war, rumor of wars. Jesus says, let me tell you what to do. When these things shall begin to come to pass, he said, I want you to look up. I want you to lift up your head. I want you to quit looking at your surroundings. Quit looking at what you see in the natural. Get your eyes and your affection set on things above. Colossians 3, 2, set your affection on things above and not on the earth. Quit looking at what's around you. Quit looking at it. Quit looking at the peril. Quit looking at the trouble. I'm telling you, the trouble's coming. The trouble is here. The adversity is here. We're becoming more vile. We're becoming more wicked. We're not getting better. We're murdering more babies. We're murdering babies right after they're born. We're condoning same-sex marriage. We're lauding. We're extolling sodomy, same-sex marriage. Church denominations are embracing same-sex marriage. Men that claim to be men of God perform same-sex marriages. That's not a man of God. That's a hireling. How can you blatantly, flagrantly disobey the word of God and yet say, I'm a man of God? You're not a man of God. You're a liar. You're not a man of God. You're a hypocrite. You're a hireling. And we have so much of it in the church today. It's everywhere. It's in everything. And then we got the anti-Semitics who, who are just castigating, impinging, hammering people that are Jewish. There is the Israel of God and there's the Israel that's not of God. There's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then there were those who Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Jesus knew what was in every man's heart. He knew who those that were true Jews and who were not. He said, if you were Abraham's seed, you would keep my commandments. And they said, oh, well, wait a minute. We be not children of fornication. They were the seed of Abraham, though, weren't they? Yes, they were, but they were not the promised seed. This is where men are blind. There's two types of seed. There's the seed of Ishmael. There's the seed of Isaac. You tell me which is the promised seed. You hear people run around saying, oh, God is a God of unconditional love. No, he's not. I know that statement right there blows some of you out of the water. You, 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 you say, Pastor Langford, that's a false statement. God has unconditional love. Oh, he does? Why then does he say, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated? I thought if God had unconditional love, he'd love Esau too, wouldn't he? Why didn't he love Esau? Fundamentally because Esau didn't love him. Esau did not value his birthright. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall inherit the kingdom of God, shall enter into the kingdom of God. That's not unconditional love. That's conditional love. You have to do the right things for God to say, I love you. I'm letting you partake of my eternal kingdom, except a man be born again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father but by me. That's conditional. That's conditional. People say, well, you're almost preaching that Jesus is, 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 is prejudice. He's prejudiced in the sense he loves you and says, you're not getting to heaven 
any other way but by me. Not through Allah, not through Muhammad, not through Krishna, not through anything else. I'm the only way, Jesus said. That's conditional. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. That's John chapter 15, verse 7. Uh, John 15, 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. Revelation 2, 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. That's not unconditional love. That's conditional. If, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's conditional. Well, I don't believe that. That's why you're in a mess. That's why you're being deceived. Why did God put these 1,522 ifs in the Bible. That means there are conditions that must be met if we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. If, if, if. Well, I don't think that's what that means. That's why you're in the trouble you're in. That's why you're in the mess you're in. Because you don't believe what God says. If we confess our sin, if, that's conditional. That's a caveat. Caveat emptor. Buyer beware. Of course, you're not buying salvation, but the emphasis, the emphasis here is you better be weary. You better be aware. You better be careful. You, you better not take hook, line, and sinker, all the garbage that's being espoused in the world today. Remember the man named Naaman, the king? He had leprosy, didn't he? God could have healed him just like that. But you know what God said to the prophet Elijah? You go down to the river Jordan. You dip yourself in that muddy river. And his indignation rose up. He said, does this prophet of God not realize I am a king? His servant said, hey, if he had told you to done something that you would have liked, you would have done it. You would have went and bathed in clean water or, or eaten a nice meal or dinner. Whatever the prophet would have said, you would have done that. But because the prophet says, go wash in the dirty River Jordan, you balk it. But you know what? He went and washed, and he was made completely whole. Condition. Condition. Yet you'll hear people say, Oh, God's love is unconditional. Doesn't matter what. Doesn't matter anything. You better rethink your theology. When all these things begin to come to pass, we're supposed to know. We're supposed to understand Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. You better wake up. Better wake up. Well, I'm not interested in waking up. I'm I'm happy. I'm happy where I'm at. Well, I'm glad you're happy where you're at. But if you're not where you need to be, you'll be sad in the day of judgment when you're not where you ought to be in God, not in Christ Jesus. So who's taken away here? And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Verse 38 tells us those that were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. See, when the flood came, they became sober, but it was too late. It's not the righteous that's removed. It is the wicked that God removes. It's very clear. 
Don't let nobody mess you up theologically. Two women, as I said, shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken, the other left. As I said, that's still something they do in the Middle and Far East. Women still grind at the mill. Then Jesus says here in verse 42, but know this. Now we're talking about knowing. Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Jesus said, but know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. What this speaks of here is the suddenness, the absolute suddenness of Christ's return. You will either be ready or you will not be ready. I'm 64 years old. Thank you for all the birthday cards. Thank you, Brian, for the chocolate, brother. That man blesses me with chocolate. Chocolate truffles. Woo! That man knows how to buy chocolate. He knows how to bless this man of God. And I thank all of you for every, every blessing, every gesture, every kindness that you have bestowed upon me and the ministry and my wife. And thank you so much for that. This speaks of the suddenness of Christ's return. You will be ready or you will not be ready. How many listening to me today played hide and go seek? You remember that game, hide and go seek? I, I played it. Somebody had to be it, and everybody else would run and hide. And like at my grandma's, my grandpa's, the old, the old well house, that was the, that was base. And everybody's trying to get back to the base without me tagging them or one of them because if you get tagged, now you're it, and you got to go find somebody to tag them before they get back to home base and can touch it and be cleared of being it. But we all, we all had to count 100, 99, 98, 97, 96. And then we get down to 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And what were the renowned rewards that we would say, ready or not, here I come. Ready or not. Here I come. And you went to try to find somebody to tag before they could get back to base. And if you did, they were it. Now you weren't it. You got to go and hide. Well, Jesus is coming back to this earth whether we are ready or not. The 24th chapter of Matthew, some theologians have espoused, advocated, appropriated that Matthew 25 was just a continuation of Matthew chapter 24. It was when we canonized, I should say we, when they canonized the scriptures, they put chapters and they put verses. These letters were continuous or contiguous. They, they were always connected, but man broke them up gave them chapters, gave them verses. But when you look at what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 24 and 41 and 42, it goes right along with the 10 virgins. Now, Matthew chapter 25, verse one says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto 10 virgins, which went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil and their lamps with their vessels. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. The Greek says, our lamps are gone out. 
But the wise answered, say, not so. Lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. I want to emphasize, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. These were all virgins. They all had the same desire, go out and meet the bridegroom. They all had lamps. They without a doubt possessed their virginity. But they didn't endure because they didn't take oil. Now, there's been a plethora of men that have tried to define what the oil represents. Some say it's the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Well, I'll say that's not what it was because the Holy Ghost had not yet been given. John 7, 38, 39. He that believeth in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Holy Ghost, which had not yet been given, for Jesus had not yet been glorified. So I, I'm not going to say it's not the Holy Spirit, but if you take the chronological disposition, the Holy Ghost hadn't yet been given. See? So what is it? I believe it's whatever you need that will keep you ready at his return. Is it the oil of faith? The oil of having no fear? The oil of trusting in God? But the emphasis is on one aspect. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. They that were ready. We're living in a time when there's a greasy grace, playboy, thin theology preached, live like hell. You can't lose your salvation. Don't worry about it. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You know, once you get saved, if you're just 12 years old, you can commit adultery, you can commit sodomy, you can rob a bank, you can kill somebody, you can get drunk. Don't worry, you're going to heaven. What, what, what kind of garbage is that? And then they say, well, you never was saved. Oh, so, so you know when people are saved and not saved. You're the righteous judge. You have the power to look at a man and say, well, uh, you never did get saved. There can nobody ever tell me I was not saved and full of the baptism of the Holy Ghost when I was 12 years old. You can't tell me that I was. And, 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 and I have a, a sordid, debased past that I'm ashamed of. But you can tell me all I want, all you want to. You was never saved. I know I was saved. I had the baptism in the Holy Ghost with fire, but I backslid and I drifted away from God and I, I got stooped. I got steeped terribly in sin. Don't tell me I was still going to heaven while I was living in that kind of sinful lifestyle. That's a lie. I knew I wasn't fit for the kingdom of God. You forget Luke 9, 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What does it mean to look back? It means to backslide. And then God says, if you do that, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. I didn't say that, folks. I didn't say that. Jesus said that no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit. Now, that's pretty hard. He said, you're not fit for the kingdom of God if you do that. 
Well, what does that mean? That means to get saved, go back, smoke dope. Go back, chase women. Go back, commit adultery. Go back, commit fornication. Go back, get drunk. Go back, do for, uh, watch pornography. You're looking back. You're going back. What do you think backsliding means? It means you're going back to sin and your sinful lifestyle. I'm so fearful of people that sit under lying preachers, under lying ministries, under lying ministers and ministries who lie. I'm going to bring a guy on here real soon, if I haven't already got him on by the time you hear this, John Lopez. I'm going to bring him on the Hagmans. Got a powerful, powerful, powerful testimony who was once into Calvinism, was once into once saved, always saved, until God cleaned his clock. Honest man, pure heart, wanted to know the truth, and God flipped him. God will flip you if you want to be flipped. Now, some of you don't want to be flipped, but God wants to flip you. Let me get back to my, my message here in Matthew 24. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this. Here again, there's things you're supposed to know. Those that were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, they knew not until the flood came. Jesus says to us in Matthew 5, uh, 24, 43 here, he said, but know this. He, he said, you need to know this. What do you need to know? You need to know that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch, that means the hour, the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Jesus is advocating, he's appropriating watchfulness. Watchfulness. Matthew 25, 13, the closing statement relative to the ten virgins. Watch, therefore. Watch, therefore. For ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You got to watch. You got to watch. Verse 43, but know this. What do you know? What do you know? It's been said in life. It's who you know. that will help you climb the ladder of success. The key thought here in this verse is readiness and watchfulness. The phrase had known. How would the goodman of the house have known what he should know? By knowing the signs. By watching the signs. Now, time does not permit me to give you all the signs. We talked about it here in Matthew 24. Wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, earthquakes, famines, false prophets, false teachers, false Christ. Matthew, uh, uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous or dangerous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away, ever learning, ever learning. But they're never able to come to the knowledge or knowing the truth. I just, I, I, if I remember, there's either 19 or 22 sins in 2 Timothy chapter 3, there, verses 1 through 
seven. It's either 19 or 22 cents. Ever learning, ever learning. What's the problem, though? He says they're ever learning. This is the generation, ever learning. Here's the problem. Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I like to take the word truth there and change it. Never able to come to the knowledge of Jesus. You say, well, you're, you're twisting the scriptures there. Let's see, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth or the love of Jesus. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. This is why our conference, April the 5th through the 7th, is different. It's different than any conference you're going to go to. I'm not trying to educate you about drones. I'm not trying to educate you about transhumanism. I'm not trying to educate you about things of the world. I'm trying to educate you about a man called Jesus. And I want that man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to touch your life. That's why I brought in one man that will have be teaching something in a secular mode, and that's Hugo de Garris, because you need to hear that aspect. And I'm pleading with God I'm begging God, I'm beseeching God, I'm imploring God, God, save that man in this meeting. Please, will you help me pray that? Will you please help me pray that, that God will save him? Let me tell you, the Holy Ghost can come down in that place so powerfully, so mightily, that it'll shake that place. Acts 4, 31 says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. I'm asking God to shake that place. I'm asking God to shake that place. I'm bringing in anointed men of God that fast and pray. And I'm not talking about fasting television. I'm not talking about fasting and eating milkshakes and drinking smoothies and, and all that. I'm talking about doing without food, that you don't eat anything. You do without. That's what I'm talking about. That, so the power of God will be there. I, I, believe, I believe we're going to see a move of God. I'm telling you, not because I am putting this conference on, not because I am going to be one of the speakers, I believe God's going to move because of the price people have been paying. Just, just got a, an email the other day. Now we have people coming from Africa. Africa are coming. Netherlands, Australia, Canada, California, all throughout the United States. We've had a tremendous, tremendous surge of people coming. And by the way, there have been several people, uh, Sister Arnell and, and a brother Jackson have sent some extra money to help to buy people some tickets. So we've got a, we've got a handful of tickets to help you come. Somebody's done paid the way. You you want to check with us and see if they're still available? We, we've given away already numerous tickets because somebody's done paid for somebody's way. Matter of fact, Brother, Brother William said in his letter, he said, I'm sending this extra money, 
If, if they don't come, it's their fault. Some, I'm paying the way for somebody to come. When you leave, when you leave the Hickory Metro Convention Center, I want you to leave and say, my God, this, this Holy Ghost that Pastor Langford preaches, this Bible that he preaches, it is real. It is real. You see, I'm not going to compromise. You can forget it. That's why I don't fit in. I don't fit into anybody's circle. I just don't. You say you're bragging or you complaining? Neither. You see, a lot of people d don't want me in their circle. I want to be where God wants me to be. And so I'm going to obey the Lord. I'm going to do my best to be led by the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to preach uncompromisingly. These men are going to minister and preach uncompromisingly. They're going to pour out their hearts. We're going to pray for people. We're going to water baptize people. We're going to have communion. And I, I don't doubt my calling. I don't doubt my gifting. I don't doubt the mantle, the anointing that I carry in my life. Now, I... I if if you're if you're not careful, you'll you'll be critical when I say things like that. But my wife and I, we fast and we pray. We 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 cry out to God. We 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 humble ourselves. Now I know there'll be those. Oh, he's not a humble man. He's an arrogant man. Well, that, that's your opinion. I understand that. That's how you feel. Fine. But see, God looks at the heart. See, my, 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 and I've said this, you've heard me say, my presentation, my deliverance may chap people. He's just too hard. He's hellfire and he's brimstone. <laughs> well, I may be hellfire and I may be brimstone, but I know one thing. The hellfire and the brimstone is the truth. It's, it's the truth. You see, we, we look at the personalities when we should be looking at the message is the man preaching the word is the word that he's preaching. Is it uncompromised? Is he twisting it? Is he polluting it? Is he corrupting it? What is he doing to the word of God? There'll be those who will take the word of God and make it say things. It doesn't say, it doesn't say some things, but they make it say things, but it's not saying it. And it's not going to say it. I'm excited, man. I am so, so excited. And you see, the people that are coming, they're coming with their faith. I've said before, if you could take my faith, your faith, all of those of you who listen and watch, and we could put our faith in a, in a box, uh, let's say we put it in like a swimming pool. All of us dumped our faith in that swimming pool. Whoever walked into that swimming pool of faith, would be healed, would be delivered, would be set free. There are people coming in, in a mode of absolute faith, faith, faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Oh, we're going to have a move of God. Oh, you, you, you can rest assured that there's going to be a move of God. This is not going to be mundane. This is not going to be hyperbole there's going to be a move. there's going to be a move of god there's going to be a tremendous move of the holy ghost because god has assured me when i started this out weeks ago i was down on my knees beside my bed my wife was at her mother's i was beside my bed it was in the morning and i was crying and praying out to god asking for God's blessings. And the Spirit of God spoke to my heart and says, why do you doubt me? I've helped you build two churches. Two churches. One appraised for over a million dollars with the blueprints and the land. He said, I helped you do that. Can't you believe me for something a whole lot far less than that? 
That's that's about one tenth of this conference, or a little less, about eight percent of this conference, as far as expenses. And I, I told Brother Alan Marcotte, I said, my faith in the last seven or eight years, it's not been challenged. My faith has not been put to the test. I haven't had to have it tested because I haven't done anything that took a measure of faith. Anytime you get ready to do something for God, it's going to take faith. It's going to take faith. And you all know, you all know, I'm not going to ask for the money. Somebody could sit down today and say, hey, pastor, what's it going to cost to do this? Here's a check. I'm covering the, all the expenses. You don't have to worry about it. But you, there's one thing I'm not going to do. I'm not going to ask for that. I may ask God, but I won't ask you because it's God that supplies the needs. And if that's what God wants to do, God will touch somebody's heart. That's how big God is. I know. I know. I know. When I built the last church, a man called me one day and said, the Lord told me to give you $50,000 to build that church. That's a pretty good size offering if you ask me. And we, that's what helped build that church. People just like that. Another man, his wife came, gave us a check for 35000 said, we, we felt led to pay off the land you just purchased. That's why I don't ask for money. I don't have to. You know, these charlatans, there's 30 people listening to me right now that God is speaking to to send $1,000. That is nothing but a con artist. That's a charlatan. That is a huckster. That's all that is. <laughs> I, 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 that's why we don't do, we don't ask for money and we're going to make it by God's grace. We're going to make it because God is faithful. If I'm faithful and I do my part, you can rest assuredly. God is going to be faithful and God is going to do his part himself. God loves us and God wants to bless us unbelievably. What a great lineup. What a great lineup. Steve Quayle, Russ Dizdar, Brother Irvin Baxter, Jimmy D. Smith, Joe, Doug Hagman, Hugo DeGaris. We have Sheila Zelensky now going to be speaking. And, of course, myself. These people, all the people are fasting and praying and asking God for a touch. They're asking God. When I when I asked Doug Hagman, he said, Pastor, he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, just the other day, this has been some weeks ago, he said, just the other day I was thinking, what if I got invited to a conference? What would I say? What would I say? What would I do? And he said, here you are calling me. I said, brother, God's getting you ready. God's getting you ready for this conference conference these people that i have asked to come and speak will come i believe and obey the holy ghost some of you listening to me you're going to be healed some of you listening are going to be delivered some of you listening your loved ones are going to be saved and washed in the blood of jesus christ some of you are going to receive the baptism of the holy ghost you're going to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives you utterance. I'm not going to do it. The preacher's not going to do it. The Holy Ghost is going to baptize you in Holy Ghost fire. Then after that, we're going to have communion. After that, we're going to have water baptism. We're going to have church, church. And when you leave there, you're going to say to everybody, "Woo!" That was one more conference. That was a revival. That was a move of God. That's what's going to happen. Hearts and lives are going to be changed by the power and by the spirit of Almighty God. So please put this on your calendar. Put this on your agenda. April, April the 5th through the 7th. Go to our website, register, and come on and be a part of this. Before we leave today, Listen to this little commercial spot we have for you. 
everywhere we turn, there's deception. And to help you better identify this deception, David Langford and the Voice of Evangelism has assembled a stellar lineup of speakers for their Age of Deception conference coming to the Hickory Metro Convention Center April 4th through 7th. Join David Langford along with world-renowned researcher and author Steve Quayle, Douglas and Joe Hagman of the Hagman and Hagman Report, artificial intelligence expert Hugo DeGaris, Irving Baxter, host of the internationally syndicated biblical prophecy television program End of the Age, along with Jimmy D. Smith and Russ Gizdar for the Age of Deception Conference, April 4th through 7th at the Hickory Metro Convention Center. You can make your reservations now online at thevoiceofevangelism.com. Registration fee is $100 per person. Find out more about the speakers and their speaking schedules at thevoiceofevangelism.com. And make your reservation now to attend the Age of Deception Conference coming to Hickory, North Carolina at the Hickory Metro Convention Center April 4th through 7th. I pray that you'll come be a part of this great, great, great conference. God is going to bless. I've got people coming and bringing their children. They want to get them saved. You see, we preach salvation. We make altar calls. We make appeals for people to come to the altar and give their life to Jesus Christ. You know why we do that? I'm a true, bona fide minister, man of God. I make an appeal for the lost. I'm appealing for the lost, the backslider, the tepid, the lukewarm, the indifferent. That's who I am. I am a minister of the gospel of Christ. I didn't choose this as a vocation. This is the gift and the calling of God. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see some of you tomorrow night on the Hagman. Others we'll see next week at this same time in the Lord Jesus Christ. God the bless you. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.